Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 65th uh, Radical Poetry Reading. I am Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a poetry reading featuring poets Nan Cohen, Ralph Hamilton, Karen Liegas, Matthew Olsman, all lovingly curated by Angela Narciso Torres. Just a few quick notes before we get started. Uh, here at The Rail, we acknowledge that Black Lives Matter and that we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we'll be posting in just a moment. Over the past 21 years here at The Rail, we've undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, poetry, of course, um, alongside thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we do need your support. Uh, this December, we are fundraising $150,000 in 31 days. Your contributions will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations at the rail for the coming year. Uh, please check the chat for more information and links to donate, which again, we'll be posting shortly. But now to jump right into it, I am very uh, honored to welcome our curator of the day, poet Angela Narciso Torres. Angela, over to you. Thank you so much, Nick. And good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be, to everyone. And welcome to this radical poetry reading that I'm so honored to have curated for you all. It's so nice to see friends from all over. And I'm so grateful in, uh, for, for all the ways in which we can be connected here and in the ways that poetry has connected us in various ways throughout the years. Um, thank you, first of all, to the good people at the Brooklyn Rail for inviting me uh, back to curate this event. And special thank you to Nick for stepping up to host us today. So when I was asked to curate this reading, it was around the week of Thanksgiving. And the question that came up to, for me was, who are some poets in my life that I'm truly grateful for? Not just because I love their work, of course, that's a big part of it, but also because I admire the way they move in the world as poets, as editors, as teachers, and human beings. So um, soon I realized that the names that kept coming up were of poets who had nurtured me through my growing pains as a, a baby poet, if you will, and also taught me about being a citizen in the literary community and the world beyond. So I wanted to do a reading around this idea of mentorship, of poets mentoring poets, and how we le lean on each other and learn from each other and support each other um, and look to each other's work and relationships for support and encouragement and direction. The dictionary defines a mentor as a wise advisor, an intimate friend who is also a sage counselor, especially of one who is inexperienced. Many of you may know that the word mentor originated from the Odyssey, mentor with a capital M being the friend of Odysseus and advisor of Telemachus. These poets that I've invited today have each through their body of work and in my associations with them through the years have been all of those, advisor, friend, teacher, and counselor to me and continue to be to this day. Through their poems and by being just by being who they are as awesome human beings, they've given me a kind of a map to navigate through the forest. And I've invited them today to share work in the spirit of poets, mentoring poets, in hopes that you too might experience this light that has helped countless travelers, including myself, to make sense of the dark. So having said that, um, I'd like to uh, introduce our first poet, Nan Cohen. She is the author of three poetry collections, Rope Bridge, Unfinished City, and most recently, uh, the chapbook, Thousand Year Old Words, which was just out this past October, um, and which I'm very excited about. My copy is in the mail, I'm still waiting for it. But it came out from uh, the lovely Glass Liar Press in Chicago. And of her book, uh, the publisher says, these, in these poems, Nan Cohen explores such words as cleave, loss, spell, hand, and home, revealing both their sturdiness through a thousand years of constant use and the radiant individuality of the experiences they describe. 
And indeed, for me, these mic this microscopic attention to words and their multiple layers of meaning, this pure delight in language is what I learned from Nan in those first poetry classes I took from her in the early 2000s at the Stanford Continuing Studies Program, where she taught soon after completing her Stegner Fellowship. As one of my first poetry teachers, Nan gave me a vocabulary, my first vocabulary to talk about poems and to find the right questions in figuring out what makes them work. From her, I learned the importance of laser sharp diction and of fresh language, things that I continue to learn from her poems, whose honesty and clarity unravel the complexity, complexity of being human with effortless musicality and heart. How lucky I've been truly to have Nan as my first teacher and how lucky we all are to have her with us here today. And without further ado, I welcome Nan Cohen. Take it away, Nan. Gosh, um, I'm, I'm a little choked up, Angela. Um, thank you so much for gathering us and to um, Nick and the Brooklyn Rail for hosting. Um, I'm in Los Angeles on Chumash Keach and Tongva land in the San Fernando Valley. And it's an honor to be here and to read with Karen and Ralph and Matthew. Um, I'm going to begin by, by our agreement. I'm going to begin by reading a brief essay about mentors um, and then a few poems from a chapbook that's just come out. Um, this appeared last summer in Amsterdam Quarterly in their themed issue on the classics. On mentors. Mentor. The same word in English, Dutch, and more than a dozen other languages is easily defined. In actual use, however, it is a slightly fraught term. Mentoring implies disparity in age, in experience, almost certainly in power. To have or to be a mentor requires a degree of consensus between mentor and mentee, but this is usually unspoken and there are no real rules or rituals around the connection. Some institutions have attempted to formalize mentoring at the school where I teach. Uh, for example, each new mentor, uh, each, each new teacher is assigned a mentor who offers informal guidance and helps the newcomer learn the culture of the place. The connections that form from these arrangements are often collegial and warm, but are they truly mentorships? I think not. Particularly in the arts, and I'm thinking primarily of writers here, authentic mentorship is not bestowed by institutions. Perhaps it is at its root, anti-institutional, the organic symbiosis of two individuals' idiosyncratic needs. And it is temporary. To be someone's mentor is a role, not a permanent appointment. We see this even in the story of the original mentor in Homer's Odyssey. Sailing off to the Trojan War, Odysseus left mentor in charge of his house. 20 years later, the place is overrun by Penelope's suitors. Mentor speaks up for Telemachus's plan to set out in search of Odysseus, but the suitors shout him down. He is of no practical help until Athena takes on his appearance. Once she does, the plot starts moving. In the voice and guise of Mentor, she promises Telemachus she will help him get a ship and crew. You will achieve the journey that you seek since I will go with you just like a father in Emily Wilson's translation. She recruits a crew, borrows a ship, casts a sleeping spell on the suitors and hustles Telemachus to the ship and out to sea. And then she leaves him. In a showy way, after delivering him to his first host, Odysseus's old Trojan war companion, Nestor, she transforms into a bird and flies away so that it's obvious to everyone Telemachus has been companioned by a god. Still, she's gone. So much for going with him, just like a father. Like his real father, she's left him before he's ready for her to go. The man called Mentor is no one's mentor. Athena is. She comes in many guises. She keeps showing up. She watches over Odysseus, sending him fair winds on his long journey home. She appears at crucial moments as a king, a shepherd, a young girl, to point one of the heroes in the right direction, to get them moving. As in other myths, her supernatural transformations reflect the magical changes that are possible in the lives of ordinary humans. Rather than a permanent role, mentor may be a sudden infusion of the mentoring spirit into an ordinary person. Perhaps this is even truer for writers who are most fully themselves when they're alone, 
like the ancient goddesses and gods whom mortals cannot safely behold, but who somehow keep finding ways to guide one another. Our true mentors may not even wear the guise of writers. A grandmother may assign us a quest. A friend might give us a magical object. A conversation with a stranger can point us in the direction we need to go. Only rarely will our mentors accompany us far on the journey. Sometimes what they have said to us becomes an inner voice that we can hear long after they have gone. And some leave us merely a sentence or two, delivered at the right time, remembered forever. Before Athena leaves Telemachus, he asks her in her mentor disguise, how to approach Nestor for help. He's too young, he says, untutored in, speeding, in speaking to kings. Looking straight into his eyes, she responds, you will work out what to do through your own wits and with divine assistance. The gods have blessed you in your life so far. So thanks for um, listening to that. It was fun to read it aloud. Um, I have not yet read from my new chapbook, Thousand Year Old Words, um, with this beautiful cover by Steve Asmussen from Glass Liar Press. Um, uh, it's a group of poems that came out of a book manuscript I've been working on for several years. Uh, like a lot of poets, I'm obsessed with time. And I think of the oldest words in English as being like time travelers. Um, thousand year old words are the small, humble words that hold language together. So like the word I, right? We might say a dozen, hundreds maybe of times during the day, you know, so often that it really disappears from our attention. Um, and there are other words, very common words that have changed so little, right, since the 10th century CE, hand, child, you know, table. Um, I imagine that if we could travel in time, you could stand next to somebody who lived a thousand years ago, you could be looking at the playing of light on the water in a lake. Um, and, you know, the other person, she would say to you, you know, shimmery on, you know, which is like the old English word to shimmer. And you would say, you know, yeah, shimmering and we would understand each other. Like that, that is really moving to me. So they're mostly quite short. Um, the first one is uh, shimmer. A thousand year old word is a needle pulling a thread that is centuries long. A thousand year old word wraps itself around a quality of light and like light itself seems ageless, untouched by time. Light travels through imperfect glass into darkened rooms, but moves with the same vigor. A word may have taken in a trembling it did not have a thousand years ago, but all we can know is how it shimmers now, wrapping itself around the ageless light. It was how light found him, that shimmer was the light's surprise. And now of all the words I cast toward the place he once appeared, this is the one that wraps itself around that emptiness, that absence where he stood. Loss. A thousand year old word is a loosening too. The human hand opens eventually, lets go of what it held. A thousand year old word escapes the mouth, the eye rolls off the tongue, sorry. The L rolls off the tongue, the vowel splays wide, ah, the teeth close on a hiss, on nothing. This one is called home. The throat shuts, a small emptiness opens. A thousand year old word is a bite of air, the thing itself and the loss of it. Like the door to a place we used to live, the old paint peeling or repainted green. Haunt comes from home. It's where the ghost goes. Soul. Of these poems, David asks, who is the we? And I am stopped. That is a holy question. For I had forgotten the small, the humble words that hold language together, like the hand forged nails that held pieces of wood in the shapes of window frames through which at any moment in a thousand years, someone might look to see someone coming up the path to the door. Um, and the last one, and I thank you all so much for being here, is, is called I. 
Um, it was published in the Inflectionist Review under the title, The Word I. I can't see the blood rising through the hollow needle until it begins to fill the tube. Nor can I see the air becoming breath as it's drawn into the lungs, imagined as two flaccid balloons inflating around the heart or becoming air again, unless I were to stand close to a mirror to see a soft cloud form on the glass. Considering this body, how I might know and not know what it contains. Considering this word, another container, standing upright on a base, head open to be filled. Thank you. Beautiful. Wow. Nan, thank you for that gorgeous reading and for sharing your essay, which um, so many people have commented on in the chat. Please feel free to, to check those love notes from our audience and, and the poems. It felt to me like I was sifting through a, a jewel box and I wanted to just hold each of those gems and, and look at them and and appreciate them more but you know we have to move on and i can't wait to to read all of them in your new book when it arrives thank you so much it's just such a pleasure really to hear this and to be on the receiving end of all these uh, of these poets that i i love and admire so much it's such a gift um our next reader is ralph hamilton Ralph is the author of the full-length poetry collection, Teaching a Man to Unstick His Tail from Sibling Rivalry Press, a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. Of his book, Alison Joseph said it best, Ralph Hamilton's poetry is a tapestry stitched from flesh and beauty, wound and salve. Ralph was editor-in-chief of Rhino for 14 years, and um, that's how I met him. He still serves as consulting editor and board chair, lucky for us, so he's still involved in our meetings. Um, but when I joined Rhino's editorial staff in 2009, he had just taken over the role as editor-in-chief, and I had just recently moved to Chicago uh, and graduated from my MFA. I knew next to no one in the literary community, but being part of Rhino changed all that and opened the world for me, really. Rhino became my poetry family and my introduction to the Chicago writing community at large, thanks to their efforts in, um, in the community, such as the Rhino Reads uh, poetry series and the, the poetry forum at the library, a free monthly poetry workshop, which is now online. But it was Ralph's wisdom and benevolence and his rigorous yet inclusive poetic sensibility that made every meeting a masterclass for all of us co-editors. His generosity also extended beyond the work table. He provided valuable feedback to my first book, my first poems, and in revising and shaping that manuscript. And he did that for, for many of us um, around the Rhino table, several co-editors who um, have published their first books because of his, his discerning eye and his generosity in helping us you know, shape our manuscripts. As my fellow editor and my friend, Ralph has taught me to seek transcendence in the ordinary, beauty in loss and heart, most of all, heart in despair, in my own poems, as well as in my life. Please help me in giving Ralph Hamilton a warm welcome. Ralph, take it away. Thank you, Angela. Um, as, as I thought about mentorship, uh, what I was most aware of is how much I've gained. Um, and, and, and because of that, I, I thought today I would, uh, the first two poems I'm going to read are, are poems that, although you may not know it, Angela, um, you influenced. Um, because in, 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 in your writing, Angela, there are, there, there are qualities that, that I, I still admire and emulate and hope someday to nearly approach. Um, one is the enormous tenderness of your poems. They're, they're always filled with, with such heart. 
The, the, the second is a, a kind of intricate feeling for place. I'm, I'm always so transported and grounded uh, in each of your poems in a, in a moment, in a, in a place. And, and the third the, the, is, uh, and this is gonna sound mighty highfalutin, um, is a being thereness. Um, Heidegger call, uses the word Dasein, meaning uh, that the sort of braided sense of viscerality and mortality and particularity that is the stuff of life. And, and you know, I, as any poet, I always have critiques of my own work in the back of my head, but in, in, in your work, I found this, this delicacy and this presence that, that I, I did learn from and still learn from and, and aspire to. So I'm gonna read um, two poems that um, I think in, in different ways reflect that. The first is a, um, actually it's, it's a poem about my aunt's suicide, but I was trying to tell it a little bit differently. And the poem is called Earth Song. Perhaps that day, impossibly blue, Sarasota Bay glimmered, bottomless and good, turquoise glass unbroken by current and wind. Perhaps as she drove home that day with her radio on, past palms, jacaranda, amaranth, and sea grape, Julia, my aunt heard a voice call like warm autumn rain, like the indigo echo of night at dawn, like her mother's cupped hands calling and calling above the engine's low thrum. Perhaps that music still hadn't ceased as she eased the car inside her garage and lowered the door, listening, let the motor lull, found perhaps the shadows there soothing, found Mahler's dark soiled song enfolding her close, found air, her tongue tasting of loam, tasting of silt, sound filling her body with night blue drift, filling her lungs with alluvial root, calling, calling, her heart beyond surfeit, so full of deep bloom, calling her so suddenly full of earth's wrapped green hum. And the next poem, um, uh, my mother had a, a massive stroke well more than a decade ago and um, uh, became aphasic, which means sort of lost the capacity uh, to speak. This one's called Making Sense. Only 30 years more used up than me, except her mouth makes a newborn's O. Oh. Mother fingers my hand as if dandling a doll. Wants to, cannot. Wants to, remember. Traces a thumb. Nuzzles the palm, breathing my scent. Cradles my hand close to her chin. Cannot, wants to, almost, remembers, tiny nails, so perfect, they already scratch. So the, 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 the final poem I'm gonna read 
today is um, a different kind of mentorship. Um, I think one of the ways all poets are mentored is by the poems we read, by the poets we love, whether we know them or not. And, and one of the ways I've, um, I guess, uh, tried to, to uh, uh, adopt mentors for myself is, is writing uh, centos and semi-centos, uh, poems in which the voice of, of someone else, some other poet is speaking, um, but I'm in a sense appropriating it uh, through, it, as if channeling it through my, my own voice. And in the case of the semi-centos, mixing often a couple of poets as well as my own words together. Um, so this one's called The Mother Broken, semi-cento from Charles Olson and John Berryman. One, I have had to learn the simplest things last. First, you break. Main Street is deserted. The heart is a clock. Grief is fatiguing. Two, I am a vain man. I've never been good at math or gluing bits back together. I don't know one damn butterfly from another. It shouldn't be hard to believe damage is final. I have strained everything except my ears. Three. I am two eyes, a pelican of lies. When mother broke, I tried, but not too hard. The heart is a cloak. I hunt among stones. The only way I'll ever be whole, milky and smooth like sea glass. Cling to me and I promise you'll drown. Love me, love me, love me. Four, is being broken into more and more parts, fine and sharp as sifted sand, democratic as dust, really the end? How small is this news? I'm only a glass, says the glass. Sometimes I hold the sea, sometimes the sun, though never more than this dark wine. Break me. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, thank you, Ralph. I thought I was the one who was supposed to make you cry, not the other way around. And here I am smearing my makeup. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I really um, appreciate those kind words, but truly the way that you write about loss and in all its forms so elegantly and somehow managing to find beauty and order in the chaos that we live in has informed my, my writing so much, especially for the second book, which is really all about the, the devastating losses that we've that I've gone through the past year and a half. And also the unguarded tenderness in which you write, which a professor once told me, it's going to be very hard for you to publish those books, because those poems, because, but keep writing them, that's your voice. But that's not what the poetry world usually wants to hear these days. And and reading your poems has really um, allowed me or given me permission. And sometimes that's what mentors do. They give us the permission to, to write in our voice if we're lucky enough to find the right mentors. And, and if they keep showing up like Athena in no matter where we live in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. And now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing poet and linguist Karen Yagas the author of Archipelago Dust, 
which Victoria Chang has praised for its introspective speaker who reflects on her adopted America with thoughtfulness and grace in poems that deceive in their order and surprise in their leaps. Karen's research interests include myths and folklore in contemporary Filipino and Filipino American literature, as well as heritage language teaching within the framework of critical pedagogy. So in my first semester at Warren Wilson's MFA program, I was overjoyed to see sitting there in the lecture room, a fellow Filipina poet who already knew the ropes. During those residencies, Karen and I bonded over trips to Asheville in search of real Asian food on our day off, but also over our doubts and anxieties as women poets of color navigating the poetry landscape. I admired so much how Karen's po poems never lost sight of where she came from, yet always engaged in the larger conversation, drawing from her family and cultural lore while taking up larger issues of immigration, displacement, identity, love, loss. Her poems teach me to question fiercely what I know, what I think I know, not to be afraid of letting in both light and dark, and most of all, to take leaps in poetry and trust that the reader will follow. It's my great privilege to present to you my dear friend, the brilliant poet, Karen Yagas. Thank you so much, Angela. And um, I am so honored to be in this circle of poets um, and teachers and mentors. Um, in the spirit of our theme, I do wanna start uh, with reading one of your small poems in the book that has stayed with me that I've carried. Um, you're such a great friend and a mentor, not just in how you move in the world, but how um, I, I've really seen you kind of take um, ownership and reclaimed your voice and how empowering that is um, to all of us who are who have doubts, you know, who who are finding our way onto the page. And this poem is by Angela Torres, Feather. The almost neon sheen of moss spreading like a stain on the ash tree's grooved bark. The hammock's frayed rope to which the finches return, trailing silk to their nests, but mostly the quiet of a neighbor's house. White drapes billowing, bring back those silences I moved in as a child a shadow slinking through empty rooms. Dust motes tunneled light above the cold floor where, belly down, I sprawled, goose feather in hand. If I lay there long enough, if I brushed the feather on a fixed spot on the pebble-washed floor, how long before I'd make a dent? The point is not that when night fell, there was barely a scratch. The point is how, armed with a feather, I believed I could make a mark. Thank you for the power and <laughs> the, the profound um, agency of that poem and the tenderness. Um, okay, I'm going to start. I have, uh, I'm going to be reading mostly um, recent and new work. Um, when I think of mentorship and mentors, there's one part of me to think of all the big mentors, right? Especially when I started, when I first started writing, um, Angela mentioned our MFA um, program, which Matthew now teaches in, and those were great teachers. Um, and then I realized, and I love Nan's co uh, essay for this, how, how mentorship over the years became associated with poets I've met, young poets who taught me, how to be adventurous, how to be playful, new ways of seeing, how to be brave again. Um, and also um, another word that I associate are friendships and community and how much I resisted being called a mentor because exactly of that, of that power that's intrinsic to it, but that realizing that we're all doing it for each other. And um, I love um, this community because it's, it's, it's a community that's happy happily um, assimilating all, all, all poets all the time, you know, if um, we're walking together on this path. Um, I, I want to um, 
to do mention a specific concern that I've um, I've been grappling with in my work, which is um, for a long time I've had this divide between writing from um, my personal experience and writing about larger frame of politics and history, and I and I, I want to in this reading kind of give um, give light and um, acknowledgement to 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 work and to the thinkers and the poets that have kind of illuminated some of that path for me. Um, my first poem is about, it's about the, my own personal loss. And I think that that big wall between the personal and the political begin to crumble a little bit when I realize that even the deepest losses that I've experienced have, have a political dimension to it. This one is called, um, there's no name for a mother of almost a child. Um, and it is a line from um, Maggie Smith's um, Keep Moving, her nonfiction book. And it's dedicated especially to all the women whose, whose reproductive rights right now are, are being attacked. Somewhere in this world, the blanket I tented over my head after the calendar got marked Somewhere, the flip phone I used to call the friend I trusted most. Somewhere, the women with the soothing voices and M who picked me up to shield me from the signs outside, straight into a taxi that is no more. The receipt for the fondue we ate near the ferries. Somewhere on a wall of my apartment, a ghost print of my 24-year-old palm pressed back with a yes, I exhaled to a childhood friend gushing over her growing belly and the no, I shut in on mine, sizing back. Somewhere, the candles I lit. Some years later, the rituals that feel like seething through rain, a list of names. Somewhere, the beads I once believed in. This next poem is called Gratitude Journal. I flinch a little as I reach for it, this practice we do each night in bed. Our pillow talk these days, when sending ourselves off to sleep needs less effort than late night sex. Does this flinch expose how little regard I have for joy? Is this why I clasp our $1 journal like an amulet? One time I wrote, oysters at the balcony, all shucked by you. Another day sleeping in. You always think a task at work, some beautiful fish or other. Tonight is a small entry, the word end, how I carry a small syllable to bridge in me the scared and sacred to help me sing well enough the everyday swirls and chaos. Can I do one small thing to further as along? My early ancestors survived by turning towards what they must destroy. They killed so much and now I don't have to, at least not as much, especially not myself, not the tenderest part. Other poets um, who have helped me kind of think of this engagement. Um, one is Robert Haas in, in the Community of Writers Conference when he said, you know, if you're thinking about your politics, your audience is your politics. And to me, that sums up um, all these concerns about who I write for, what I write for, and I think um, it, it made it a little bit more conscious for me. And also the poet, um, I'm trying to find her quote, the poet Salmas Sharif in one of her essays in which she uh, was thinking out loud about activism and poetry. And I love what she said, and this is her from her. I'm interested in what activism can learn from poetry I believe failure in activism is often a deficiency of lyricism, an inability to collapse time and distance, a refusal to surprise or make it new, a willingness to calcify into rigid and limiting expectations, a closure to self-transformation, an, uncons an unconsidered we or you, to name just a few. 
in this. I believe social quests for freedom have much to learn from freedom enacted on the page. And this conversation should happen on the level of reading and not, as it often is, solely on the level of intention. Um, and so this po two poems, um, one is called Pre-Departure. You are going to a country where you can have a human shape without being such. And so you must first promise. It's a simple enough premise. Learn the phrase, a human is here. It means more than your name. You ask, is there anything we can be but human? This country is home to forest guardians, duendes, shapeshifters, tao po, repeat it, accent on the last syllable. What you say, who you say it to, opens doors. You will announce you're a person outside someone's gate, what the visited will hear before they let you in. Our country is a beauty mark on the Pacific's cheek. Everyone you'll meet would have said it, the dirt poor, the dirt wealthy. The paramilitary says it, then waits for the targeted to open their door. Claim your tongue, no matter how flawed, you must shapeshift again, again, and again. I have two more poems. This one, for those of you who travel a lot and come back to the US, will probably, my husband at least, recognize it right away. Are you bringing fruits, plants, seeds, animals, disease agents, snail, soil. Oh, border agent, buffed and blushing. Monsters are portable too. The one Hollywood imported, the one wild and winged and cleaved at the waist. She would travel her tendril tongue across your stonewall abs to reach the soft liver, her hunger a murder. What is the value of all the articles that will remain in the United States? I must have heard you say particles, which is only partly what we are, since we are also waves reporting back to the moon. Forgive me, I must have been daydreaming of pounded rice sweetened with crab fat. I am looking at you and thinking fondly of red, necessary agent to other colors. It's 5.40 a.m., we are both hungry, and my advice is bread. Do you know a rosebud that refuses to bloom is called a bullet? How many flowers now spangle our streets, dear agent, since our country is a clenched fist? Step in front of the camera, try not to smile. Oh, but I have more to declare. My last poem is simply called, It's Okay You Can't. And I, I write it. For all, of, for all of us who need a little bit of consolation and light, especially, well, I write it mostly for myself, but especially in this season of, um, of darkness and very short days. It's okay, you can't. You can't imagine seeds past the seedlings if you don't think you'll praise the world again as it dims. If there's no language you speak, the living understand. Those beyond words and breath, it's okay, it's only their company you keep. I give you back to the forest, to the roots that are your medicine, to those who carried you while you were busy looking elsewhere for love. I give you back to yellow cakes, balloons stamped with your name, all the possible colors, the tamarind pulp and crushed salt they had balled into candy, the wooden Christ your grandmother sent, his thorned head gathering dust near your old books. I give you back to idle hours, to the accounting that has failed to your favor, to your secret loot that is the fallen abundance of winter, more oranges than you can eat. There's no hunger you can summon up to confront it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Angela, and thank you, poets, in this reading. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. Wow, that was just gorgeous and stunning, the way you pay such close attention to the smallest things. Someone in the chat said, you've made me see candles, rain, and beads in a new, richer, and deeper way. And that's just how I felt, how your poems can do that one small thing to further us along. And that's what poems must do for us. Um, 
Yeah, thank you. That was so rich and so generous. Um, now, last but not the least, I'm very, I'm very excited to, to introduce poet, author, and essayist Matthew Olsman. He is the author of Constellation Root, his latest much awaited third book, forthcoming from Alice James Books in January, in the new year. His two previous collections of poetry are also from Alice James. Um, they are Mezzanines and Contradictions in the Design. And as Karen mentioned, he now teaches in the MFA program for writers at Warren Wilson College, where we all met a lifetime ago. And even back then, Matthew impressed me in our um, associations and workshop and in our conversations outside um, the, the classroom, impressed me with his dedication to craft and his discipline of, of his daily writing practice, and most of all, his seriousness in the pursuit of making, making it new. From Matthew, I've learned and I continue to learn to search for poetry in the most unexpe unexpected places, in newspaper headlines, in the lives of saints and supervillains, crossword puzzles, outer space, and even the depths of the ocean, but always, always in the service of finding out what it means to be human. As one of our teachers and my mentor in the program, Karen Stuhl, C. Dale Young, and Matthew's honorary, um, uh, mentor. He said, Matthew Olsman's poetry is that rare thing that embraces complication while filling us with wonder, incorporating the playfulness and oddities of life that allow us to laugh hardest at ourselves. Prepare yourself to be dazzled. Take it away, Matthew. Thank you, Angela. It's good to, it's good to be here with, with you all. Um, so on the on the subject of mentorship, I've had like uh, like no fewer than a thousand teachers, and uh, uh, this first poem is by one of them. This is by Patrick Rizal, who is one of my uh, mentors uh, when I was at uh, the Kandiman retreat. Um, Brokart, just like that. When the bass drops on Bill Withers, better off dead, it's like 7 a.m. and I confess I'm looking over my shoulder once or twice just to make sure no one in Brooklyn is peeking into my third floor window to see me in pajamas I haven't washed for three weeks before I slide from sink to stove in one long groove, left foot first then back to the window side with my chin up and both fists clenched like two small stacks of stolen nickels and I can almost hear the silver hit the floor by the dozens when I let loose and sway a little back and just like that I'm a lizard grown two new good legs on a breeze bent limb I'm a grown-ass man with a three-day wish and two days to live and just like that everyone knows my heart's broke and no one is home just like that I'm water just like that I'm the boat just like that I'm both things in the whole world rocking sometimes sadness is just what comes between the dancing and bam my mother's dead and bam my brother's children are laughing just like Okay, it's true, I can't pop up from my knees so quick these days, and no one ever said I could sing, but tell me my body ain't good enough for this. I'll count the aches another time, one in each ankle, the sharp spike in my back, this mud muscle throbbing in my going bones. I'm missing the six biggest screws to hold this blessed mess together. I'm wind rattled, the wood splitting, the hinges are falling off. When the first br bridge ends, just like that, I'm a flung open door. Um, I'm gonna read, read a couple poems by, uh, by former students. I think one of my favorite things of, um, about this exchange of, of teaching is when I start to, when I see, when I find their poems, um, uh, when I just encounter them in the world, when I'm reading a magazine and see one of their names show up. Uh, and then, and I'm usually left with this feeling like, how did they do that? Uh, this one is by uh, Margaret Ray. And um, it's called, while wandering in Montreal, I mistake desire for that feeling when you actually want to be another person. Or when, sorry, when wandering in Montreal, I mistake desire for that feeling you get when you actually want to be another person. If I look at a woman outside this grocery, I won't say waif-like, won't say boyish, her, her shaved head, her thin neck, these 
are words I've been taught by male writers. How can my looking be different or differently charged if I still want to look at her body, but all I have are the same old words. Here, people are speaking in French, which sounds soft, romantic, but it's a language of invaders like English. Just think how it got here. I got here by driving across the border from Vermont and also a and also via a violent history of colonization, I am looking at this woman and wanting. Maybe I can turn instead to my own breath elevated temperature only slightly where is the border between wanting and wanting to be, wanting to touch her skin or live inside it. Sometimes the TV shows me what I've been wanting all this time and didn't know it. I watched Killing Eve and think, oh, Oh, I want to dress up and be someone else. Oh, I want her to cut me like that. And you can find that poem um, in a, that, that one appeared in Third Coast and I'll put a link to it here. Um, and this is by uh, Josh Lopez, Meditation on Beauty. There are days I think beauty has been exhausted but then I read about the New York subway cars that dumped into the ocean have become synthetic reefs. Coral guilds, the stanchions, feathered with dim Atlantic light. Fish glisten, darting from a window into the seagrass that bends around them like green flames. This is human-enabled grace. So maybe there's room in the margin of air for us to save ourselves from the trends of self-destruction. Or maybe, such beauty is just another distraction, stuffing our hearts with its currency, paraded for applause. Here in the South, you can here in the South, you can hear applause coming from the ground. Even the buried are divided. At the bottom of the Gulf, dark with Mississippi silt, rests the, the broken derrick of an oil rig. And isn't oil also beautiful, ancient and opaque? like an allegory that suggests we sacrifice our most beloved, likely ourselves. In one photograph, a sea turtle skims its belly across a hull, unimpressed, unimpressed with what's restored, barely aware of the ocean around it growing warm. And hold on, I meant to drop a link to that one too. And, um, I was looking through my, my poems thinking what, wondering what, I, what poems kind of spoke to this theme of mentorship. And some of them are clearly influenced by other people and some of them are in conversation with other people and some of them um, are just impacted by the writing of others. And uh, th this poem was a poem that felt like it sort of embodied uh, some aspects of, of today's theme. So this is called Commencement Speech Delivered to a Herd of Walrus Calves. Young walruses, we all must adapt. For example, some of your ancestors gouged the world with four tusks, but now you can grow only two. It's hard to say what evolution plans for your kind next, but if given a choice, you should put in a request for thumbs. Anyway, congratulations. You're entering a world that's increasingly hostile and cruel and full of people who will never take you seriously though that will be a mistake on their end. You are more tenacious than they know. You'll be a fierce and loyal defender of those you love. You will fight polar bears when they attack your friends, and sometimes you'll win. Of course, odds always favor the polar bear, but that's not the point. The point is courage. The point is bravery. The point is you are all fighters, even when the fight in which you find yourself ensures unpleasant things will happen to you. For example, the bear will gnaw apart your skull or neck until you stop that persistent twitching. It will eat your skin, all of it, then blubber, then muscle, then the tears of your loved ones. In that order, it will savor every bite and you will just suffer and suffer until the emptiness can wash over you. The good news is things change. For example, the environment, climate change, indeed is bad for you, but it's worse for polar bears 
whose conservation status is now listed as vulnerable, which is one step removed from endangered, which is one step removed from extinct, which is a synonym for hooray, none of you get eaten. I suppose this will make some people sad. Even now they're posting pictures on the internet of disconsolate polar bears on, on melting ice flows, drifting toward a well-deserved oblivion. They say we need to stop this. They say we need to do something now. These people are not your friends. One cannot be on both Team Walrus and Team Polar Bear at the same time. I'm not saying these people are evil. I'm saying it's time to choose a side. I'm saying sharpen your tusks, young calves. Your enemies are devious. You need to train yourself to do what they won't expect. For example, use computers, invest in renewable energies, read Zbigniew Herbert. Unrelatedly, your whiskers make you appear to have mustaches, which seeing as you're not even toddlers yet is remarkably unsettling. Babies that look like grown men freak me out, like those medieval paintings by so-called masters where they'd make the face of little baby Jesus look like an ancient constipated banker. If that's what God really looks like, it's no no wonder we've done what we've done to the earth. Maybe you can repair what we spent lifetimes taking apart, replace some screws, oil some hinges. This might sound impossible, but have you ever looked at yourself seriously? Take a quick look and tell me how a walrus face is even possible. Everything about it defies the laws of physics. You will exist beyond the reach of nature. You will learn to slow your own heartbeat to preserve oxygen while diving to depths of over 900 feet. You will stay awake for up to three consecutive days while swimming on the open sea. And when the ocean is too rough, so terrible with longing, so ruptured with heartache, you'll find a small island of stone or ice offering refuge. It will be difficult to climb from the water, but because there is hope for us all, you will hoist yourself up using only your front teeth to drag your body onto the shore. Thank you for listening. I believe up next is Angela. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, if I may uh, interrupt, I am, I'm, I'm so honored to introduce and welcome uh, our curator today, poet, Angela Narciso Torres is the author of What Happens Is Neither from Four Way Books 2021, To the Bone from Sundress Publications 2020, and Blood Orange from Willow Books 2013. Recent work appears or is forthcoming in Poetry, Poetry Northwest, and Prairie Schooner. A graduate of Warren Wilson MFA program for writers and Harvard Graduate School of Education, she received first prize in the Yates Poetry Prize. She serves as a senior and reviews editor for Rhino Poetry. Born in Brooklyn and raised in Manila, she currently resides in San Diego. Um, Angela, without further ado, over to you. Thank you, Nick. And first I wanna say, oh my gosh, Matthew, I'm speechless. I, <laughs> I looked over to my son and I'm like, how, how do I even respond to this reading? Wow, I mean, it's just, uh, I have, for, for one, that walrus poem, I, I don't think I ever laughed so much in a poetry reading as I did in that, I mean, to the point of tears. And, uh, but also it made me, it, it made us all think and, and feel so deeply and fall in love with the world all over again. And that's what your poems do for me from one book to the next. And I can't wait for, for the new book that's coming out this January. Um, well, seeing that we're at 11 o'clock, I think what I'll do is, you know, I, this is my third time reading of the Brooklyn Rail and, I, and they've been so generous to me and you've all been so generous and I really want to leave the audience with your words in their minds. So I think I might just read one poem from one of my page mentors, my, one of my adopted mentors who really was instructive to me and, and, and was a healing force last October when I um, contracted a breakthrough case of COVID. And I really feel like books mentor us over the years and that they find us. You know that Zen quote, when the, when the student was ready, the teacher will appear. Well, Mary Roofley was a teacher at Warren Wilson, but I only met her once. I had her sign a book because I was so intimidated by her. And she, um, she was so cool and, and fun and witty and smart. And um, I, I, I had all her books, but I never really dove into them as deeply as I did during those days of self-isolation. 
Um, her book, Dunce, is my favorite of, of the books that I read over those 10 days. And they're, because they have this quality of just intensity of attention to the smallest events and objects, as if the, these were artifacts. And that coupled with a nagging sense of, of mortality threaded through this book was somehow particularly salient during those days, salient to me during those days. Um, it taught me to be what she calls a spectator in the museum of everyday life. Um, I dedicate this poem to all the mentors, uh, to Ralph, Nan, Karen, and Matthew, and all that came before and all that will come after. There will be more. Um, it's a poem about a baby learning to walk on the beach by watching seagulls, the way we all as baby poets learn to find our wings, to grow our wings by watching the others fly. It's called Long White Cloud. How did the bare bum child crawling on the beach in a pink sunbonnet learn how to walk by watching seagulls? How did my mother decide to marry my father by buffing her nails, then staring at her hands? How did so many unpronounceable words come into being? And how many more words whose meanings are unclear or obscure? Why do seagulls cry while land birds sing? How did the agitator of the soul become himself so violently agitated? How could someone crying out a cloud, a white cloud, a long white cloud be naming a country? A country is not a cloud. A cloud is not a country. Only the agitator of the soul would have you believe it. Seabirds cry to be heard over the waves. Landbirds sing to let everyone know. A silky corner of a cornel of red osier makes good kinnikinnik. My mother gave simple advice to all. Do not grow up to be a baby. And the baby stood. And the baby took a step. And then another and the seagulls scattered into a cloud, a white cloud, a long white cloud, and the baby cried to be heard over the land of the living. Thank you. Thank you again for all of your poems, for your words, your wisdom. Thank you for all the the guidance and um, mentorship over the years. Um, I continue to learn from all of you and I thank you to all of you in the audience that I hope have experienced some of the light that I've been so lucky to receive um, over the years and today at this reading. Thank you all. Um, Angela, I wanted to ask if, if we did wanna have any conversation at this point. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. We open to any questions in the audience, or if poems have uh, poets have questions of each other. Um, I, I know some of you may have um, prepared some questions to, um, to to address the the idea of mentorship and the poems that we all read. So yeah, the floor is open. Uh, if there are people in the chat who would like to ask a question, you you may um, put them in in, in the chat and um, or or just um, let let Nick know and he'll unmute you. But yeah, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm just like so full. My heart is so full and um, I leave it up to you to, to continue the conversation. Um, Ralph, Karen, then Matthew, any, any words, last words or questions? I'm seeing so many lovely comments on the read in, in, the, in the chat. Thank you so much, everyone for, for your for your engagement and attention and generosity in listening to these poets. If I may um, direct it, maybe Ralph, would you want to start us off with a question? Well, it's it's not so much a question. It's just the you know it's the richness of the topic and the the the, the multiple ways that we've all sort of chosen to enter it. 
um, beginning with Nan's wonderful essay, of course. Um, you know, just for me alone, I, I've gotten a much deeper and more complex understanding of mentorship, I think, than I entered uh, the reading with, um, beginning with that essay, but, but also with the, 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 the textures and, and subtleties with which each of the poets is brought to their, their choices and their readings. So it's really rich for, for us, I think, um, as readers as well. I don't know um, if Nan or Karen, Matthew, if, if you had any thoughts to share. It, it just feels like there's something about uh, opening up a space as, as Angela did and as, as you've done for us, Nick, that um, to think about just that, that vast pool of something, you know, goodwill um, connection, just that reaching, just that reaching out impulse that seems, I mean, I always want to make claims for poetry that, that maybe exceed <laughs> um, reality, but there just seems to be something about poetry and mentoring that maybe again, something about reaching through time uh, and the way you can be mentored by a poem uh, by a poet that you've never met, that um, that I'm just that's just palpable to me now that wasn't before. Yes, and the idea that the more the more generous that people have been to you, the more you you want to give back. It, that's just how it works in the poetry community. I always tell my students that. Um, the poetry world is unique in that because we don't have a lot of support from, from the government budget, artists really do have to support each other. We lean on each other. We lean on the ones who came before, the big poets, the small poets, everyone is important in this community. And, and what's interesting is the more you give, the more you get back and the rewards are, are almost never monetary. But in this space, I feel that so much that I've, I've gotten so much from each of you and it makes me want to continue to give back to this, this community, community that's been so generous to me. And yeah, I'm just grateful, so grateful to be part of this conversation with all of you here and everyone else that came before. So if, yeah. If I may, actually, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Lisa in the audience. Lisa, if you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to share your question with us. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I, you know, I think like everyone here, just I'm so grateful for this theme of mentorship and poetry, and I'm so struck by how um, naturally and often loss comes into that theme. Um, but what was less expected is to hear these poems where learning and loss seem to be on an equal footing and really um, weaving in and out. And um, that leaves me with, with um, a feeling of really being supported, you know, as a human and as a, a writer, as a poet. And I'm wondering if that, you know, just if, was there an element of surprise for that in, in each of you in in you know, coming through these poems and essays and, and um, finding the work that ends up in front of you. Thank you. Thanks so much for that question, Lisa, and for, and for your um, attention and engagement in this reading. I was wondering, Matthew, if you, you might speak to that question in terms of, um, um, uh, in the context of your new book that's coming out in January, because I'm really interested in that project that I, I believe is a, mostly um, uh, comprised of epistolary poems. Is that right? And how 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 you came to that idea of using epistolary poems to 
to encapsulate so many poems about, about that uh, learning about the world and, and also of loss. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's funny, like, uh, so this, it was conscious. Uh, I mean, you don't get a, a book that's mostly like epistolary and apostrophe poems and uh, all sorts of these, each poem having a, some element of direct address speaking directly to someone or across time or to like objects or actual people um, it, uh, by, uh, uh, by accident, you know, I was like consciously thinking of it while I was, while I was write, writing the poems, but, um, but, but it actually is something that kind of started like really when I started writing decades ago, like my earliest, the early, earliest attempts at poems were just really like unmailed letters, things I wanted to say to people but couldn't say, um, th things that I thought of saying later, things like that. I had a, a teacher when I was at a community college who said something to me like, Matthew, um, all poems are basically letters, especially yours. Or And he said something, and I wasn't quite sure what he meant at that point, but I think it, um, and at different points in time, that uh, I've continued to remember that and carry that that those sentences with me. And at different points in time, that's meant different things to me. Like, um, but um, but mostly, I, I think about how it means. Like, you're you know, each each uh, each poem is trying to create like a type of connection, and the type of connection that it, you know that's the the conversation that's happening there is between the speaker and the reader but there's also this type of conversation in terms of you know all all the poems that you've ever read you know you're kind of in conversation with those and all the writers that you're thinking of and all the and then readers that you might never see so um i'm not sure if i if i answered your question uh your question angela or if i lost track of it but in thinking of like the various conversations that the book is involved with it like it's it's sort of a version of me talking to other people but there are also other writers have contributed a few letters so there's like other voices besides mine that are sort of entering that no no that's great um there's something about writing to another, whether it's a walrus or, or um, a plumber or a saint, it's like um, just the knowledge that you're writing to someone who, who might be listening or, or who, who, who may respond or what, what would their response be? And that so, somehow informs our writing. When I had COVID, I was um, daily, um, I had this daily exchange um, with, with a friend, Lucia, who's here, a poet friend, and we, we would write these tanka to each other. And I found a different energy and a different voice in those poems that otherwise wouldn't have been there if I, it wasn't a, a direct address to someone who was listening out there and not just, you know, screaming into the void outside your window. So I, I see that um, that that in those letter poems that there's a quality of attention and energy that that's not um, usually found in, in poems that that are, are not written in that direct address. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for that thoughtful response. And Karen, I wanted to ask you, um, about that poem about the gratitude journal. I, so many people uh, in the audience, I could see them nodding and someone said, I love that gratitude poem. And, and I, it made me think that somehow all our poems um, are, are kind of a uh, gratitude journal. I started to feel that way, especially this year, any time that a poem would come to me, which was rare this year, um, there was this feeling of just, this is a gift, this came to me and to me, you know, your poems have such a sense of that, that debt to our history, to our families, to our students, to those who have come before us. And I wonder if you could speak to that, to that, um, that th thread, that impulse in your, your in your poem, uh, in your poems. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And uh, yes, and it, it's a journey of basically training myself to thank to give thanks for everything, especially the difficult feelings. Um, and, you know, I think I started engaging with writing again and even publishing because <laughs> on a very simple reason, my friends are, like you and my friends, you know, who are publishing or out in the world as activists are doing such good work. And, I, and the part of me that's so relational is going, but how can I call myself friends of these people if I'm not doing this work? And so to thank, to thank that difficult emotion of feeling left out and then engaging it, you mm -hmm. know, and my, my husband and I at the beginning of the pandemic, 
and he was traveling a lot, we started this journal. We literally would write down and it, it feels very cheesy and very, <laughs> very California kind of practice, but it, um, and that's why every time I reach th th that line of flinching a little bit, because it feels so, you know, like so tender and vulnerable, but it actually, we were talking last night, we stopped it eventually this practice, but there was so much that, um, that opened up because of course, you know, psychologically and by evolution, we have that negativity bias, right? By to survive, we, we have to remember the negative things because we have to run from, from a predator or something. And it, it's really a training of um, making it a little bit more equal to pay closer attention to the things that nurture us. So, yeah. And my, my training now is then not to turn away from things that I'm, I'm ashamed of you know, my own pettiness, my own feelings of inadequacy or, yeah, but thank you. Well, I think um, on that note of gratitude would be the best place to end this reading. It's, it's we're at 11.15, but yeah, gratitude. I, I just want to say thank you again for, for the poets, for the listeners, for the Brooklyn Rail, Nick and um, Malvika, who helped set this in motion, even behind the scenes, for, for bringing us all together in this, what I feel like is sacred space that we don't normally find in our daily lives. And I'm so grateful, so, so grateful to all of you for, for, for being in this space with us today. Nick, any last words? Yes, I, I would like to just echo that, that gratitude. Um, thank you so much, Nan, Ralph, Karen, Matthew, and of course, Angela. Um, I'd like to highlight also um, something that Bonnie shared in the chat saying, uh, such vibrant, invigorated, necessary readings. Thank you all for your generosity. So I think that was a perfect way to put it. Um, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, where we will upload today's conversation shortly. Um, we're here every day. Uh, so join us tomorrow at a special time at 12 p.m. Eastern for our next installment of Publishing in Transit featuring beloved press Belladonna with guests Marcella Durand, Tanya Foster, and Zoe Tuck in conversation with Cole Swenson on literary publishing. Uh, we'll, we will open and conclude with readings from our guests. Uh, so now I encourage you all to turn on your microphones as we say hello and goodbye, and um, to take this gratitude with us uh, to, on the rest of our days. So thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you, Angela. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, everyone. This has been great. Thank you. Beautiful Happy holidays, Wednesday. everyone. Happy holidays. Mm -hmm. your, hear your voices and see your, your lovely faces and um, hope to see each other in person sometime. I feel like if we were all in California, we could all go out for some fish tacos or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's 40, it's 34 degrees right here, right now. <laughs> and we'll just just so you know. I'll never say never. One day we'll get tacos together. Yes, yes. Please. Anytime. Call yeah. me if you're in town. <laughs> we'll do that. All right. Thanks again. Thank Thank you all. Everybody. Be Thank safe. You. Be safe. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Love to all. Bye.